deep note and um, wanted GPUs, we might ask and they might you know, see what they can do and they might offer us some, some compute. Um, those are the best options I have in terms of uh, you know, being, needing a big GPU if you want to train something deep. Um, I mean, unless you have a big graphics card at, at home, that, you know, that's kind of how it goes. That's a good question. I would say ask us early just so that I can get that conversation started. But may, maybe like in your project proposal, if you're thinking I might be compute limited for this, um, you know, call that out earlier. I have seen RL projects that <laughs> sort of run out of time, <laughs> like, um, right? You know, like my learning curves aren't going down and you know, things are due. Uh, and it just takes a long time to run simulations. So. That is a risk with RL. <laughs> We're good to go? Okay. Thank you for uh, figuring that out under, under pressure. That was great. Okay, so um, I, there's a important, I think, thing that I, you know, so we've been talking through a lot of, a couple different almost complete solutions, but I feel like there's an important piece of the puzzle that I haven't given you a good solution to yet. Um, and I want to talk through that today. So, um, you know, we've been talking this week about clutter clearing as, as just an example, right? Um, <clears throat> and I would say the quick summary of our simplified bin picking strategy has been, first you maybe get the hand out of the way, use your cameras, acquire and pre-process all the point clouds from the candidate bin, right? You sample and score those candidate, possible candidate grasps using our antipodal metric, but we have, I said antipodal plus plus because it also, the one I implemented threw in some uh, preference for reaching down from above and some other things like that. So it had a few other terms in the cost, okay? Um, and then we, then you would complete with the, you know, the recipe from, from before, you turn that into like a gripper trajectory that's gonna go down from my current hand position to the, the grasp, right? And then you're gonna bring that over to the other bin, drop it off, uh, and you'll, prob you'll execute that trajectory with diff IK. That's what we've given you so far. There are other ways to do it, but that's, what, that's the tool chain so far. And then you're gonna you know, repeat until some termination criteria or whatever, and maybe at some point you start, start picking up things from the other bin and putting it back so you have a closed system that can run for a, a long time. Now, um, the thing that's happening here that didn't really happen given our previous assumptions is that a lot of those steps can just fail, <laughs> right? Um, for sometimes good reasons, sometimes um, less good reasons, but you know, let's just uh, list a little bit of, of what, are the, what are the things that could fail in that pipeline? What are the steps that are sort of not guaranteed? Yeah, the grasp could just fail, right? So I could, um, I could go down, I mean, maybe the, um, maybe I just, I closed my hand there and it slipped right out, right? So it was like a failed grasp, right? So it might be that right at the moment of, of closing the hand, I could sort of check if I've got something, if my hand closed all the way and there's nothing, you know, the fingers are touching each other, that's a failed grasp, you know? The, um, so there are sensors that will allow us to detect that, you know, but, uh, you can also have a tenuous grasp, right? And then once you start lifting or moving, it slips right out, right? And we also talked about, um, you know, maybe I picked up the hammer by the very corner and it just sort of torqued itself out, right? It's not just, okay, um, that's definitely one. What else can fail? Yeah. Right, it could be that there's, um, there's a good grasp that exists and I just didn't find it with my antipodal strategy because antipodal is not you know, absolutely guaranteed to exist in, in, in some metric or it could be that I just sampled not enough, right? What else could fail? Yeah. Right, right. So um, bad point clouds, right? 
reflections or transparent objects or other, you know, all kinds of stuff can screw up your point clouds. There's another big one. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's close to the one I was thinking. So he says differential IK might fail, right? So um, the fact that we've separated the grasp planning from the arm limitations, right? If there's any workspace limitations on your arm or, um, you know, which could get subtle, right? If, it, if I have to get down and, and reach, you know, it might be that, that an over the, the overhead gris, grasp in the back corner of the bin would be fine, but if I went like this, it wouldn't be fine because of the reachability of the arm. And somehow, because I've decoupled those two problems, I, I could fail downstream, right? Um, and the arm has additional geometry. It could be, I mean, I could tell you it happens a lot, actually, that that KUKA, if it wants to get into the sink, it's got this big old elbow, right? So, you know, you think about just the, the gripper getting in there, but then you're going to have a, a constraint coming from the elbow that you didn't reason about. So, um, so those really do happen for, for just joint limits, but also collisions, right? And we could go on, right? So there's, there's a bunch of things that, um, that could break in this system. And I think that's just a reality of having perception in there and having um, a relatively simple pipeline. Even the logic of deciding when you're done, it's kind of not clear exactly when you're done. You could have um, points still, you know, objects still in the bin that you just have to decide, I'm never gonna get that one, right? It's kind of stuck in the corner, my hand's not gonna fit, I gotta give up, move on to the next one, right? Now the full on, the, the TRI uh, clutter clearing has additional skills like we've talked about, sort of push things out from the corner to try to really get to the zero, but, but if you don't have all those extra layers of, of um, you know, of band-aids around it, that even just understanding when to give up, right, is, is, is something. So the big thing that's changing now that I feel like I haven't given you a good solution to yet is that we can't just sort of run through a script and be happy, right? We're gonna have um, a lot of branches, right? Um, okay, did my, did my scoring candidate find a good uh, solution? If not, maybe I resample. Maybe if I've resampled 10 times, I give up and I move on to the next, you know, uh, so there's going to be a lot more branching, a lot more um, checking, and the like in here. And even, even given that, um, I haven't told you really how to go from this sort of script into the simulation framework, right? So we're going to talk about, you know, what it means to, to execute that sort of a, a plan uh, in a situation where you're a dynamical system and somebody's asking for an answer at 200 hertz. This is sort of a procedural script, the way you'd write a, a, a um, you know, write a standard code, but that's not the way we tend to write systems, and that's not the way, um, that's not the framework that sort of guarantees that you're going to have a message ready to, to send to your robot every 200 hertz. So somehow, somewhere, there's got to be a contract which tells me how I'm going to go from, you know, that kind of logic into this, um, into this sort of tell the robot something all the time. Now, some robots will actually just power down if they haven't heard from you in, in five milliseconds, right? So, uh, okay. A lot of times that contract is a little ambiguous, right? Maybe it's if you've got a multi, ex, you know, multi-process system sending message passes, passing, you know, maybe your low-level controller is just sending a keep alive, and if it doesn't hear from you for a while, it'll just keep sending the last command, and so you're not really worried about that contract as much, and you just every once in a while send a plan over. But... Um, you know, when you get down into to trying to make these things, understand these things completely, I think that contract needs to be made more explicit. So we'll talk about that uh, today. I mean, honestly, this is a lecture I would say that I'm still getting my head around, right? I'm trying to decide exactly what pieces to cut out. And, um, and it's an interesting conflation of like what people like to do in AI, <laughs> what people like to do in control theory, what programmers like to do. Right? Somehow it's like in the Venn diagram of those things. Um, and I don't actually think, um, so you, you might look at this list and think, oh, that's kind of like a software engineering um, problem, not a fundamental problem. But I actually think it is squarely in the, you know, the place where AI, 
type planning methods and the like are coming together with systems theory. And it's, I think it's really important and, and fundamental. Okay, so um, to start off, I thought I'd, I'd do like a bit of a case study here. This is, I mean, you've seen this before, but, but we can sort of dig in now and say, how did we organize the behaviors on this system, right? I've never actually really um, presented that to anybody. Um, and there's some, there's a, some details that I think uh, aren't going to surprise you, but maybe we'll clarify something that looks uh, is complica complicated. And this system, I think, notably was taken to a very high level of maturity. So it's a fairly complex task, but it's a task that worked uh, very nearly all the time by the time we were done hammering on it. Okay, so it's a, there's a statement just of, you know, the way we typed it in this way is something that you can take to high levels of maturity. And if you guys have done, um, you know, internships at, at companies that are doing this kind of work, you'll, you know, you might, some of this stuff might look familiar. It's a, Okay, so um, you know the script that I sh the script that I showed you for for bin picking, you know, has these different components that we've broken off, and that's a common strategy. So in the dish loading, there are a handful of different you know primitives actions. So we really decompose the big task into these notion of of many primitives. Okay. Um, so this was like picking up a. I can play them again real quick, but this is picking up silverware. Oh, that was pulling the silverware rack out, you know, and then picking up the silverware. Opening the door is a primitive. You know, picking up mugs is a primitive. This is the nudging it out of the out of the corner because the hand's too big to pick it up when it was in the corner. You know, these are all composed with as different primitives. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the language that we use behind the scenes is not strips, but I think. Um, if you understand strips, which is the, which originally you know was the Stanford Research Institute problem solver, was the originally was the name of the algorithm, okay, and became known for the sort of formal language specification, which was the input format to that solver, is now what people often refer to as the strips language, okay. Um, this is an early sort of way to um, an AI approach to planning that allows you to compose multiple pr motion primitives, or well, let's say primitives, we won't include the word motion yet, okay, and try to compose multiple behaviors um, in a way that's a very natural sort of planning framework, okay? When you think about AI planning, um, you might think about graph search, right? Um, you should think about graph search, that's a, or A star algorithms and, and other kind of algorithms like this. And the, the specification languages in strips and, and its successors, I think, bridge the gap between those sort of search algorithms and a specification language, which is more about um, named actions with preconditions and postconditions and the like. Okay, and it, it just, it's a specification language that makes those planners good. So the spe specification languages, most notably here, you know, you itemize a set of actions, okay? For each, each action, you, you talk about, you know, when am I allowed to take that action? So it's, if it's the, I'm gonna um, pick up a silverware uh, this time, if my silverware is my action, right? Then the preconditions might be that I've got some detections of a fork, right? Um, and you probably won't get detections of a fork unless the fork is exposed. Uh, in, 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 pra in practice, actually, we don't pick up forks until all the plates and all the mugs are gone because, um, well, things go weird. If you, <laughs> you, can, you can find yourself in all kinds of crazy situations if you drop a fork in a mug or something like this. So we, we just decided to prioritize, you know, get the mugs and plates out and then leave the, the forks and um, everything at the bottom, okay? Um, <coughs> The, an action causes some change in the state, uh, uh, in the, um, in the yeah, state of the world, okay, with some post conditions. Now this is interesting, um, you know, this is what allows you to do prediction into the future. So if I were to say, I currently have a detection of the, of the fork in the sink, after I run my fork pickup, I'm gonna say that there's no fork in the sink, right? It's in my, or there's a fork in my hand, for instance, okay? Um, and then you can specify a long-term objective, like clear the bin, 
okay, as saying like there are no objects or you know, the point cloud is of sufficiently sparse or something in my bin. Okay, we're gonna see a couple examples of this, but, uh, but I wanna just sort of introduce this like high level notion of separating your task into actions and using a traditional planning system to se sequence those actions. Okay, the newer versions of this are, I mean, not even that new, right? But Padiddle is like the generalization of strips. So if you hear Padiddle, um, which you will hear around uh, campus, right? Uh, you might hear Padiddle stream, uh, right? Um, but uh, uh, this is a, an active, well, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, good work of, about um, this kind of planning even taken to the next level, um, you know, upstairs in Leslie and Tomas's group, for instance. Okay, so um, Padiddle just is a, a richer form of the same idea, I would say. Um, it kind of generalized scripts and a few of the other early uh, programming language, uh, sort of planning specifications. And I, in particular, it allowed you to sort of factor, um, you could, there's this notion of objects that come in and instead of having just individual state variables that get listed one by one, there's a little bit of a object orientedness of it. The detail I don't need you to, to understand, but basically it's the same specification, same type of specification as strips generalized to be more efficient and more general. Um, you'll see the same initial state and goal specifications and the same sort of actions that are around. Okay. And in practice, you know, you write these little um, you know, specification files that, that just define your predicates. Maybe the, there's a robot in a room, or there's balls, there's grippers, okay? You define actions that have preconditions and effects, okay? Different types of pick actions, preconditions and effects. And these are all written as logical operators on these kind of uh, variables. And then similarly, your, it, that would be like a, that would be your domain definition. Uh, and then similarly, you can write a planning instance where you say, I need, a, I, this is a new problem. I have some initial conditions where I have, um, you know, two rooms and four balls. I have a gripper, uh, you know, and I have to plan from the start to the goal. Okay, so that's a technology that's out there. And I think it, um, uh, it becomes essential when you're trying to compose much, you know, more and more complicated tasks where your decisions about what I should execute right now are conditioned on multi-step reasoning, right? Where the reason I should pick up a fork right now is because, um, well, maybe if I, the reason I pick up a mug right now is because I've already, you know, I want to get the rack open. I'll open the rack now because I'm going to pick up a mug next. Maybe that's a better example. Okay, when your decision right now depends on multiple steps of reasoning, this allows you to write that sort of branching logic in a much more compact form and leverage a planner to, to make those decisions for you. Okay, so how does that look um, in, the, in the TRI uh, dish loading system, okay? Um, now, in fact, it's, it's a little unfair to say, to describe it as padiddle. I'm using that to simplify it. Um, it's actually a, the, the task planner is actually a task and motion planner that's capable of more. But I think the bulk of the um, example here, I can tell you without telling you that the full glory of that. Okay, so um, it's kind of fun to like look through the code and, and see that actually those concepts really, you know, they, they appear in your, in your C++ classes and stuff like this, okay? So um, we really do define all of the actions, all of those, um, those controls in terms of this you know, action primitive interface. Similar to Padiddle, right? There's, um, there's a check that's like the, the is candidate is like the precondition check, right? So you can tell it the current state, you know, it's, I'll show you what the state is in these cases. This sort of subsampled state of the world, grounded state of the world, if you will. And it just answers the question, you know, each skill, each um, primitive, each action, answers the question, yes, can I run this now or not, right? Um, just a Boolean outcome. And then, um, sorry, the, the outcomes would be, if I did run this, what would, I, what would I expect to change about the state, right? You can associate costs 
You can associate rankings with each of those. Uh, that's a, those are generalizations of the basic Padital idea. There, there's Padital variants that include that for sure. Um, but if you want to solve, uh, you know, optimize and try to pick the best action instead of just having a lot of feasible actions, uh, that, those can be very important. And then there's just this notion of like, I'm gonna now run the skill, right? So each of these sort of um, actions has the ability to say when you can run it, say what's gonna happen if you run it, and run, roughly. And if you look through the code, there's just a bunch of, um, of actions that are at this level of like, you know, pull out the lower rack, pull out the upper rack, right? And um, this decomposition was done by humans. This was a manual step. This is something that is an active, you know, um, lots of people are thinking about how do you get those to come out automatically, but I think um, a lot of people are still manually typing in those, those decompositions, okay? And it's also sort of interesting to see the level at which these are written, right? So they're not the details of like twist my gripper at this, you know, a, a, to this angle and then push. I'll show you those details too. But, um, you know, they're more at the strategy level of like, should I do this first? Should I do this next, right? The, high, the, the task level. Part of the reason for that is because, um, you know, the preconditions for these uh, and even the outcomes uh, can be written in terms of a pretty simple and abstract state uh, of the world, okay? Uh, so just pulling into the code, right, the, the state of the dish task, right, is um, a combination of disk, dish washer state and dish state, okay? But they're basically, what I want you to see here is that they're like number of times I've put them away in integer, okay? Uh, the number of dirty items available, right? Um, they are Boolean, you know, is the dishwasher state known? Is the door open? Is the lower rack out? Okay, this is us grounding some symbols into our perception. There's a, there's a step required to do this, right? Is to have a perception system that can tell me if the lower rack is out or in. But if we can ground that perception into, a, into just like a, a Boolean classifier that we're happy with, then we can start writing this higher level procedural logic and using the, the more sophisticated planning framework to make our decisions. Right? Even the, the dish types you know, are enumerated. If you throw in something random, it becomes unknown unless it's mug-like and it might get grabbed at the mug and put in the top rack, right? Um, and some of the some of the different objects have a, a requested location in the dishwasher, right? Um, they all have like relative status as, as you're trying to to move through that stack. So um, so the the decision making there is. Um, you know, it, when you first turn the robot on, it looks at what, you know, it, lo it uses its perception system to decide the current state, and it will make a multi-plan action. Using that very simple representation of state, using an optimistic plan that basically says, I'm gonna, you know, the outcome I get is success, roughly, and the, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a. Uh, yeah, it's optimistic and it's deterministic. So it also assumes that, you know, I get what I, with, with probability one, the action is succeeds, right? Um, so to, the way to make that, that's a common assumption. It's not a, a, you know, there are people that do beliefs-based planning, probabilistic planning, planning with uncertainty and the like, um, but this is not doing that yet. And <clears throat> um, the way you then handle each outcome is that you're constantly watching. If, if you've deviated from your plan, you just replan. Okay, works fairly well, right? So if you start putting your mug in and then you, someone comes and this is like not as cool as kicking the robot at Boston Dynamics, but it's kind of, kind of similar, I guess. Um, you know, it will decide mid, mid, um, you know, mid place that it needs to set down the mug, reopen the dish rack, pick up the mug again. You know, it's got this layers of complexity that come from that task level planner. 
and it's infinitely patient, right? Because uh, you, know, you can sit there and do that all day and you think well, the robot's gonna throw the mug at me, but it never, <laughs> never does, right? We didn't, we didn't program that skill. Is that clear? I mean, is that, uh, there's, there's a lot of details hidden behind there. I wanna give you the, the sense. Anybody have questions about it? Yeah. The question is how far ahead do you plan, right? How, do you have to plan like 20 steps ahead? Do you have to plan till like the dishwasher is clean? Um, or sorry, the dish, uh, the sink is clean and dishwasher is full, right? Um, so we definitely don't do that because uh, perception isn't capable of telling us the full state of the sink. So we have to sort of have an incremental approach. Uh, you can't sort of reason all the way to the end. Uh, but the, the answer to your question about how, how far do you look ahead is actually very subtle, I'd say. So, um, you know, these preconditions that say when a skill is good, if they are very weak, if they're like loose approximations of when you should execute that skill, then, um, then looking ahead farther will, will make those stronger. Right? This is a standard thing in planning, right? So if you, um, if I had, for instance, you know, the conditions that are exactly narrowly defined, which says this is, you know, if I were to run the plan, these are the only conditions for which I would choose this skill, then I would never need to run the plan. I could just, if, it, if you know uh, reinforcement learning, like if, if, if I had the value function, for instance, as my precondition check, then I wouldn't have to do any planning. Um, if you write weak preconditions, then planning will make them stronger. Looking ahead will make them stronger. So in practice, I think we're somewhere in the middle here. We, take a, we, we do plan ahead. I would guess most of the time we take uh, we take the action that we would have taken if we hadn't looked ahead, but we always look ahead multiple steps, you know, many steps, just to make sure. Yeah? Is it essential that you do, so given that your plan is crystallizing, when something goes wrong, is it essential that you do replan to the end, or can you just replan the near horizon and try to get through those same? Yeah, yeah. So if these planners were a, a computational burden, I think we'd be playing more games about incremental replanning and, and the like, and just, you know, um, but the, the, the discrete level planning is lightning fast and, and we just go ahead and plan to the end. We don't, there's no reason not to for us. When you start adding more of the task and motion planning features, which we'll hopefully talk about in one of the boutique lectures later, um, then, then those planners can slow way down. But for the simple high level logical planning, it's fine. Yes? You, you are very wise. So, so the question was, you know, when does it actually check? Um, I do think there are a few magical places in the trajectory where it's checking, where it's, where it's transitioning between the lower level skills, um, where uh, th those are the discrete times where it checks. So uh, if we had pushed at a different time, it might have still gone to the top of that trajectory before setting it down, right? So you're absolutely right. The, the checking, well, I mean, the, the perception's running at a higher, relatively higher rate. The replanning is happening at a, at a, between the macro actions. Now, if we, I think we could, probably could do it faster, but I think uh, you know, for this, this task, that was sufficient. Those are good questions, yeah, and, and I'm happy to take them. Okay, I wanna make this point super clear, okay? which is that most of those states, there, was a po there were poses and a few things in there that were continuous values, um, but most of the planning there was actually on discrete states. The planner that we use is actually capable of much more, but that instance that I'm telling you about um, was mostly discrete state. Integer number of times I've done things, Boolean is my mug in my hand, those kind of things, okay? Planning is fast in that case. When you start including continuous state, then it's gonna be a harder problem, right? And we will, we will talk about that. Um, but in general, things get harder fast. Um, however, the notion, that's a little faint on my screen, but the notion of um, preconditions and post conditions of low level skills, I think transitions very well into the continuous domain. 
and um, any of you that have taken underactuated with me or will take underactuated with me um, know that I've, I'm a big fan of, of thinking about feedback controllers in a low level, even continuous state task in terms of their preconditions and their post conditions. That's a, you know, and there's connections to Lyapunov functions from control as ways to think about those preconditions and the like. So um, the general notion of decomposing your task into skills is I think very general. Reasoning about the multi-step effect of those skills and making a plan gets more, more expensive. Okay, people do it, right? There's something called feedback motion planning, which talks about, okay, well, if I was in this, the inside of this um, skill, this funnel, so that, that I, I maybe didn't say clearly enough. So I'm thinking of this, imagine this is like Q1 in this axis and Q2, right? The join angles or, or the continuous pose of my object, right? And the preconditions I could draw as a subset, a continuous subset of state space, saying these in these continuous values, when Q1 is, and um, you know, Q1, Q2 are less than, you know, are in some ellipse, for instance, then I'm gonna say, yes, I can run the skill in that case. And you say, after I've run the skill, um, they're gonna come out, hopefully in a smaller set, because oftentimes controllers are good in stabilizing, okay, and if the, the continuous set that I expect to be the effect of my action fits completely inside the precondition of another set, then you can imagine sequ sequentially composing these things into more dexterous behaviors. Okay. Now this, um, this idea is, I think, powering, I mean, so Al Rizzi is now, um, uh, you know, way up in Boston Dynamics. They, they, I, don't, I don't want to get his title wrong, but it's uh, very near the top of Boston Dynamics, and um, Spot is, um, you know, is under uh, Al's uh, organization, or, well, they've, yeah, anyways, um, it's a complicated uh, organization, but there's, I think there's a lot of funnels going around on Spot, okay? So, so I think that this, this idea, um, you know, I think is making real robots do amazing things. Okay, so, so I really think this, notion of programming by breaking up into small pieces and then using some level of planning to compose them is a good idea. Okay, so let's dig in a little bit more to like what those individual skills look like, okay? Um, there are some which are more like our, um, you know, just sample uh, the point cloud. There are some that are just sensing. But the low-level skills for, that are doing the work that I showed you are maybe the more interesting ones um, and we can step through them, right? So, uh, should have uh, started this from the top, right? So you can watch, we're gonna approach such that the, the mug is in view of the wrist camera. Now the wrist camera's got a good view. Now you see a little bit of adjustment. That's the visual servoing using ICP, right? The iterative closest point to make sure your, your scan matches the, um, the data and you're gonna get the pose you expected to get. Then you insert to grasp, close your hand, retract, Move to pre-place. When you drop it down, you see that the force is, you know, there's force thresholds to, to terminate. Let me do it one more time here, sorry. ICP, move, move in, retract, move to pre-place, which is a big motion planning system there. And then when it actually set it down, to, it, it sets it down by touch, right, based on, based on a force sensor. Right, because if you didn't get the pose exactly what, you don't want to rely on your estimation of the geometry to set it down. That's how you break mugs. <laughs> We've broken a few. Okay. Um, this is my favorite one, right? So the, the plate pickup. And it is similarly, um, I, would say, I, I should be clear that these were the original versions that we wrote. We wrote handcrafted versions, and now we've been doing more and more um, automatically learned or synthesized versions of all these tasks. But I think um, it's important to understand the, the first handcrafted versions of these, okay? So that plate pickup is a pretty subtle one. You have to potentially get your fingers between different plates in order to get it up, okay? Lots of um, different thresholds, okay? And it is a similar but more complicated plan about approaching the plate. So it's roughly in view for the wrist camera, visual servo for alignment. Now we start stick our finger, you know, close our fingers to roughly the right amount, insert one fingertip between the plates, 
you know, and, and so on and so forth, right? So um, you know, this type of reasoning actually gets to pretty robust, pretty sophisticated um, behaviors. In fact, so I, I like to call Siwan, actually called there too, you know, there's a, there's a sort of a type of person, there's an attribute that people can have. I know very few of them, but I would call Siwan a robot whisperer, right? It's like, um, yeah, I think different than a horse whisperer, but, uh, but sort of similar in principle. Like the robots don't work, and then Siwan enters the room and the robots work, and they do magical things, and you can't believe that someone could make a robot do that. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's a lot of intuition about what signals matter and good debugging skills and all these incredible things. But um, as much as, as many cool things as we've seen from, from learning these days, I think I would put C1 up against any of them <laughs> in terms of like, you show me a complicated task for a robot and I think someone, a robot whisperer out there could make it work. We will talk later about the learning version of it. This is one that we did upstairs in a robot local motion group. It was a kind of a, we didn't buy the sink, but we uh, did a, a similar task on the, on the tabletop. And this is a uh, neural network controller that's doing um, a similar thing. And one of the big differences of this controller is that it's, uh, it's going based on directly from perception. So it's, there's no explicit estimation of the pose or location of the plate. There's even really not an explicit notion of plate anywhere, it's just trained to go straight from a, um, a refined visual representation directly into the actions of the hand. But it still fits into this box of thinking of it as a primitive that takes things from one uh, set of initial conditions to another. I actually will, uh, in the RL section, I'm hoping to use this as a simple, this is the simplest version we've done of sort of the same kind of task that you can just hammer on in simulation. It's, all, it's even in 2D and um, you can just do direct policy search on that, so we'll, we'll play with that later. Okay, so um, I think one of the big um, challenges of thinking of programming the task level is that, you know, because there's failure conditions, there's all, there's all these different things that can happen, you know, you end up writing much more complicated code. For the clutter clearing, you don't actually need a full-on task planner, you could just write a script with a handful of branches and you'd probably get pretty far. But for something like the dish loading, that breaks the stack and you don't want to write that one out by hand. You want to write these modular, you know, I think preconditions, post conditions and use a, an AI style planner to, to handle all that branching, okay? One of the challenges with that, although I said that the discrete is, is fast, it's not 200 hertz fast necessarily. So. So taking these sort of long running computations and putting them into a simulation loop, I think is the, is the next sort of, I wanna, I wanna start bridging that gap. gap. How, do you, how do you write code sort of in the simulation loop? Is that transition clear? Yeah? Okay, so <clears throat> the examples I just showed you still looked like scripts, right? The you know, move until you touch kind of scripts and they went down a procedural script. Now, that's what programmers like, right? That's good for rapid prototyping, whatever. But if you're a controller, a control theorist or applied controls person, you don't like that representation, right? <laughs> that's, there's, there's like bad things going on. From the, the similar version of that um, that you'd see in controls are, this is an original Mark Raybert uh, hopping robot, MIT Leg Lab hopping robot, sort of the precursor to a lot of the Boston Dynamics robots now, if you will. And one of the things I absolutely love about it is that although it's, it was like the most dynamic locomotion legged thing ever, you know, certainly in the 80s, um, you know, it was just far more dynamic and uh, uh, interesting than a lot of its predecessors. The controller fit on a single page. I, 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 if you come into my office, I'll like show you the page, which has this at the top, and then like the four PD controllers on the bottom half of the page. It's like a small book with a, with one page, and it's and it's a beautiful description of a controller that, to this day, using all of the tools we have from optimization that I have from optimization theory and the like, I don't have I can't make a better controller really than that. Um, it's just a beautiful like yeah very simple. Uh, architecture, very simple design. Leverages a lot of mechanical intuition, a lot of you know, physics-based intuition. 
But what you see over and over again, when C1 or, or, um, or the folks at Boston Dynamics or whoever's doing these, you know, these robot whispering write controllers, they very often write things that are, can be spelled like a finite state machine controller, okay? So, um, Let's contrast procedural logic versus finite state machine controllers. Okay, so do people understand what I mean by procedural logic? This is like, I'm gonna say, you know, while something, if something I'm gonna write sort of my standard Python, C++ code, I might have branches, I might have whatever, this is sort of the procedural logic view of the world is our sort of standard programming interface. It doesn't have explicit notions of time, okay? It has, um, it's just marching procedurally down and, and, ex and following branches and you're always on one line at a time, okay? It's the state way we typically write uh, code. Now, <clears throat> A finite state machine is a dynamical system. You know, it fits inside uh, uh, a mathematical or a computational framework that is different than this, right? It fits inside a simulation loop where you can have, there's a multiple ways to write it, but I might say a, a discrete time one would be something like my dynamical system, okay? But I might have multiple equations that govern me, one for each state. We, um, we call it mode. So in the, on the board here, there's a flight mode, there's a landing mode, there's a compression where the leg spring is compressing, there's a thrust, there's an unloading mode, right? Each one of those is implementing some sort of a differential equation or difference equation, okay? And then we have the edges of a finite state machine, our condition, uh, which say I'm gonna, my next mode, you know, my i at n plus one is some branching logic. So um, it could be the same as i n um, or follow an edge. Not, um, you know, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that these are really, they live in the, the time stepping of a dynamical system, right? They have a discreteness about them where it says I'm only in one mode at a time, but when I'm inside a mode, I'm just a different set of dynamical, uh, dynamical system equations. They can have inputs, they can have outputs, they could be an entire system in the way we've talked about in, in class, okay, but I'm gonna transition to which one's active. A way to think about this is that the total state of that controller is the states of all the individual modes plus an integer state for the mode, right? So when I look at this sort of a procedural recipe that is written like this, <clears throat> you could potentially be written like this, 
or it could actually be written like this, where we really have a different dynamical system for approach to plate, for visual servoing, for us, you know, for uh, closing the hand. Those could diff be different states in the diagram. You could write it either way. The reason, I mean, you can imagine that, that if, I, if I wanted to say something formal about um, what's happening in the system, this representation is gonna give me more power uh, to, to sort of analyze the dynamics of the system, say something about stability, say something about robustness, you know, use all of our stronger tools, right? This system is easier, this is the, the programmer's delight, right? If you just wanna hack something together and prototype, this is way, way better, okay? Now, <clears throat> if you think about uh, programming languages at all. If you, this system, they, if they could be mathematically equivalent, then, then you know, the state of this system, which is declared very explicitly potentially, if you, if you use something like the systems framework we use in Drake or if you use Simulink or anything like that, right? You explicitly say what X is, you, know, you explicitly enumerate the mode that you're in, and you've declared all your state and your, function, your, your dynamics are just a function of the, of the state and input. The notion of state is much messier in a procedural code. It's somehow like the entire stack of your thread. You know, if, like if you're to hit your debugger and you do db stack, right? It's like that. Somehow that's your state, okay? And it's a, it's a useful state for programming, but it's a messy state for analysis, okay? So I do think this is one of the big things that, that is a gap is if you know taking code like this and translating it into this um, is a sort of a an interesting enterprise and an important one. If you if you need to somehow write your system in a way that it will always talk to your robot at 200 hertz. But like I said, there are you know people can take that kind of a, a, a an approach. This is Andy. Uh, who's, you know, this is a video you've, you've seen before, but you know, the, the task level um, behaviors here, I don't know the details, I know Andy, I, I like Andy a lot, but I don't know th what code he wrote exactly. My impression is that it is uh, you know, finite state machine-like, and it is extremely robust, even if um, you know, people pull the back of the robot and the like, right? right? There's no learning at the task level here, there's probably learning at the perception level, um, this was a few years ago. Um, but you can make these things incredibly robust by writing them in this sort of like the, the framework of, of, of these finite state machines. Success at the end, right? Okay, so... Um, you know, and, and this is something that people use more generally. Uh, I don't think, I'm not sure if this package is, is super popular anymore, but in the ROS stack, you can find things like SMAC, which is state machine, um, right? Uh, and you know, this, is, this is a tool chain that people do use, okay? But um, you know, this problem that it's trying to solve of taking something that's like a procedural code and giving it an explicit contract about having an output or a state updated every time step, bridging that gap. That's something that, um, that people have dealt with for a long time. So you get, what is this picture here, right? So um, like game developers have known about this problem forever. When I was a Europe many years ago, and I, when I was an intern many years ago, um, when I was a Europe, I worked at, with Mich at University of Michigan with a guy who was doing AI for computer games. And when I went for the summer to Microsoft Research at the time, um, I worked on this game, uh, which was a, a project at Microsoft Research because it was one of the first massively distributed um, action games. Um, Gaming Zone was new, and you know, like you know, they were doing uh, sort of character stuff, but nothing that had real-time action over the internet. So it was like a it was a it was a research project. I wrote the drone code. So if you were like ever to play this game um, and you saw like a mining drones or turrets shooting at you or whatever like that, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, I was, I was try I, I had permission to do like an Easter egg that would like spell my name in the sky or something, but I ran out of time. So uh, I, I don't, I can't say that. Um, 
But the way people program uh, these kind of things in, in games is similar to I mean, we, what more advanced um, tools that people have used in uh, robotics also, right? The problem with writing code in finite state machine is that as the tasks get more complicated, the state machines explode. They absolutely don't scale, right? You can get, if you start, you wanna add just one new behavior, maybe that behavior has to touch, has to work in all of those different, different um, situations, all these different skills, maybe, um, you know, in all of the different sequences of the robot picking something up, I still wanna be able to like stop and go home if something goes very wrong, right? Um, and so that might mean taking every one of my states and blowing it up and blowing it up and you get these like exponential growth of number of states and it became untenable. So through some amount of like, you know, research in academia and just hacking in game industries or something, a new form of, um, you know, a new format for specifying finite state machine like things was born and that was called behavior trees, right? People know about behavior trees? Yeah. Um, there was another, I guess the part of the theme there was um, uh, Rod Brooks, uh, a colleague here for many years, and uh, you know he he was part of this sort of uh, this push, I would say, from the academic side. Um, you know, this was the time where uh, Tomas and other people here. Tomas was Rod's postdoc advisor, so they were you know they were close. But um, I think a lot of people were talking about AI style planning, 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 and Rod starts writing a series of papers like. Elephants don't play chess, you know, and uh, intelligence without reason, intelligence without representation. And he started arguing that pro ro robots, real robots should be programmed with like small state machines and he built this subsumption uh, architecture. It was his version uh, at the time. And that was used to program legged robots, probably program Roomba, uh, right? I tried to find a, a subsumption architecture for Roomba. Uh, I didn't, didn't find it, but. I, I think the early versions of Roomba were running these, you know, state machine-like, but programmed slightly differently versions of uh, uh, low-level controls, as opposed to big planners. It's interesting that his um, his critique of why, you know, the traditional approach has emphasized the abstract manipulation of symbols, which whose grounding in physical reality has rarely been achieved which is a, a totally true and at the time or whatever, but it kind of has been achieved now, right? I mean, perception kind of works. Um, I mean, like, not completely. There's abstract symbols that are still very hard, but like, I can find a mug. You know, I can ground that. I can tell you if the dishwasher door is open or not, right? Um, uh, it's interesting that that, I, in my view, has, has, it's not solved, but it's, it's moved. Okay, so behavior trees, we're gonna actually have you work through um, a version on, for the, for our task on the problem set, um, but they are um, they are similar in spirit to state machines, but are but have been designed with composition and a factor representation in mind. Okay, so you'll see these these basic operators. It's a graphical programming language, uh, effectively that um, that composes different. Um, you know, so that the the way a behavior tree works is roughly you go down, you walk down the tree on every execution. You ask, you know, uh, should you, you, there's, a, there's basically logical ors and logical ands. Okay, you say, is this true? Um, if yes, execute the action, and, and it doesn't succeed, and this is an or, so maybe if it didn't succeed, I'll walk down this train, this chain. In practice, it's a simple programming language for these types of behaviors, which people have had much success building libraries of behaviors if I had like a new you know, way that the robot should go recharge its batteries, then I could bring that recharge its batteries and somehow stick it in here on my existing, someone else programmed um, you know, Roomba sort of program and it can just sort of pack into the main tree. You get this logical specification that is finite state machine like, but much more factored and easier to compose. And I'm totally serious that people in computer games you know, do this, right? So I, could, I, I wanted to, you know, like if you go to the Unreal Engine 4 behavior tree quick start guide, right? You can see how to like, where, what was the thing here? It was um, create an enemy AI that responds to seeing the player and proceeds to chase them down, right? So that's gotta be useful, right? Um, and there's like a whole GUI in Unreal Engine 
for programming behavior trees, right? So people build pretty complicated systems out of this, and uh, you know, they, they are designed around this, this fact that the, the game engines are, are stepping along at a, at a simulation loop. You have to tell me what to do at every step. <clears throat> so how does that connect back to like the systems framework and our dynamical systems view of the world, right? Um, you could t stick a behavior tree, here's an example of it from an early version of the class that we did. Um, uh, you, can, you can take your favorite um, Python behavior tree library, for instance, and tuck it inside a system and have the, the um, what do they call it, the blackboard of the, tr of the behavior tree basically be declared as the state of your system. And every time your dynamical system is evaluated, it just walks down the behavior tree and, and runs the action. And it fits right into the system's framework. It's not in Drake Master. It's one of the places where I feel that um, we could make the full stack easier if we implemented a few of these, these algorithms and, and made them available for people. Okay, so <clears throat> um, there's a thing that happens here that I want to kind of land. And I, well, I, I'm, people disagree with me on this, by the way. This is now, you know, squarely on Russ's opinion of the world, not uh, what is absolute and correct. But um, <clears throat> despite the knowledge and utility of writing, um, of writing behavior trees in computer games and stuff like this, a lot of people when they're writing robots don't, don't use finite state machines, don't use decision trees, don't even necessarily use the full planning stack. They will still write procedural code. And um, I think that happened a lot because of the sort of multi-process message passing. So, um, let's say it's Ross or some other message passing. Um, what's happening inside here? Okay, so maybe over. Here I have a simulation with a simulation time step and something that's working on, a, on a every um, you know, five millisecond clock okay, that's going around. Um, over here, maybe I have my while um, dirty sink, right? And then along the way, I just sprinkle in my decisions to send and receive messages. So <clears throat> this can work, and I think the fact that the message passing and the separate multi-process view of the world has become so easy with all the, you know, with the way that we've architected our robotic systems these days, this has become common again. What I think people, what I worry about we've lost, that maybe most people don't worry about we've lost, is that it's, um, it, it is possible, but it's very difficult to get um, deterministic evaluations in these kind of systems, okay? So as soon as you start getting multiple processes that have you know, arbitrary delay uh, in message time arrival and stuff like this, even just your CPU scheduling things at different times, um, I think you don't typically run the same ROS simulation twice, right? I mean, I think that's just not what it's built for. There are message passing systems that can do extra work to enforce timing and, and, and give some sort of guarantees there but it's very hard actually to run the same simulation twice in that kind of a framework. Um, and I think that doesn't hurt you when you're just prototyping, but when you start taking things to the next level of maturity, it really starts to hurt you. I think a lot of, um, you know, I think a lot of advanced users stop using um, some of those message passing systems because of that. It's just very hard to get uh, very repeatable, very reliable. You know, when something doesn't work, did it not work because I dropped the message or whatever? Um, you know, so it was interesting to watch sort of the, the process of taking and, you know, to work on the process of, of taking that dish example to maturity. So it was, uh, a, there was a, a system that was constantly running um, Monte Carlo tests. So making 
random initial conditions, random mugs, random plates, uh, you know, generating random, we have like procedural dishes that would make different size, uh, but, but mug-like things and generate, spit out CAD models, right? We'd change lighting conditions, we'd change all kinds of stuff, okay? And it would just be running over and over and over again. And it got to the point where, um, well, first of all, that failures in um, reality would match the rare failures in simulation, which was pretty awesome. But you'd occasionally find a failure, and, and then you'd have to go track it down. And if it was not deterministic, oh my gosh, right? And there's still not some non-determinism in that particular system, but we're still fighting it down because it's a, it's a, every bit you can get out, it gets more valuable. Um, and a lot of the most subtle bugs actually happen at this uh, behavior level, I would say. So this is kind of a fun one that, that, we, that we found, okay? So um, there was a piece of the initiation set, the preconditions for the, should I put the mug down, that had an arbitrary threshold of 0.45 on the rack position of the mug, of, of the, you know, somehow we have a perception system that's estimating the location of the rack and, uh, and if, it's, if it's out enough from 0.45, I'll continue and execute. And if it was too little, I would stop and set it down. Exactly what you were asking about before. Okay, and then we started adding, there was like the night um, when somebody decided, oh, I'm gonna add randomness to the rack perception that, that matches the statistics of the randomness we got from reality. It was this, it's this constant battle between the people trying to make the simulator harder uh, and the people making the robot better, right? Um, so someone added rack noise Okay, and almost always it was fine. Every once in a while, <laughs> it would be such that the robot would start moving. Somewhere along the cycle, it would, it would trip this thing saying it was less than 0.45. It'd be, oh, I'm gonna set it down, okay? But then by the time it went to, to decide again, it's like, okay, the rack's there, so that's good. And it would basically get in this like infinite loop of, of going like this, eh, you know, like this, nah, and it, like we never would have found that without ex extreme testing. And to be able to reproduce it, you know, it's just very, very hard to get um, deterministic results out of a system that's, that's doing this kind of stuff. So part of the mission in getting things, more things locked in in the systems framework is to just be able to run completely reliable deterministic simulations of including the whole stack. To be fair, the noise that was added was a little bit crazy. So, um, it was like, you know, yeah, the dish rack was going like that or something like this. But, it, but uh, so, so everybody was kind of like, oh yeah, that's great. You found me, a, found a bug, but that's never gonna happen in reality. And then it happened in reality. It was like one day the robot, someone how the, the rack got a little bit stuck right around the threshold and the robot started like infinite looping and we were, <laughs> okay, there you go. It, it really did happen. Okay, so yeah, please. Yeah, so, um, so I, I think that gets to the question of how do you put long running computation into like a behavior tree or a, f a finite state machine, for instance. So finite state machines and behavior trees will address that need, but they're asked to give an answer at every time step. So, um, so, the, so it takes some thought, right? Uh, I, the proposal, um, the thing we've implemented in the proposal to do more generally inside Drake is to have a, a system where if you have a long running computation, um, it just spawns a thread, does that long running computation and comes back. But the, um, the system that wraps it has the ability to, you specify a distribution of possible running times, okay? So when you're running in simulation and you don't worry about wall clock, you can allow the run, you, you, could, you can have two options, right? You can basically let the thing um, return whenever it's done and then you keep executing. Or I can basically block, I can pick a random number of my, um, of my run time, wait that long in the simulation, in simulation clock, and then block arbitrarily waiting for that to, to return. And that would turn a, you know, you could model a stochastic amount of evaluation time in a perfectly deterministic way they might be less performant at, um, in simulation, but it would be determ deterministic. So those are the kind of games that we're trying to play to, to get to that extra level of reliability. Did I say that? I, I, I said that a bit complicated, right? So, um, 
here's my main thread. It's giving an answer every time step. So at time, this is my main thread. Okay, now I'm gonna launch my um, worker thread here. Okay, and it's a long running computation that will cha ultimately change the output of my system. Okay, so you know when it whenever it returns, then the from now on I'll I'll have a different output from my main thread. Okay, and here I'm just returning I'm, I'm sending the last possible output. And the problem is that if I put a worker thread on a you know and I'm relying on CPU processing or CPU scheduling to let this thing sort of go and return whenever it does, then it might return here, it might return here, it might return here. I don't know. Okay. So what we do is we Flip a coin, you know. Say I've, I've got a distribution of possible things I've ever run times I've ever seen. Okay, I will pick a priori that this on this rollout I'm going to say it landed at this, uh, it returned at this time. Okay, and I will do, go ahead and do the worker thread. But if it um, if it took longer than I expected, I will block my main simulation thread, pretend that time stopped, waiting for that to return so that it returns here. If it returned early, that's no problem. Okay, that way I can still have a distribution of possible return times, but everything's clocked off my random seed. So if someone caught me with a, you know, that if I just happen to run too long, it's gonna hit this sort of a weird corner case, I can reproduce it perfectly. Okay, but it, it allow it permits for things to, to have long running times. Those are the type of games you have to play, I think. If there's better suggestions, I'm happy for them too. Okay, so that was a bit of a potpourri of like, how do I mix high level behavior planning with low level systems? I would say for me, there are, um, when I'm implementing a new complicated system, I think if I'm rapidly prototyping something, I will do procedural code, wrap it up quickly and, and um, not worry about the extra burden of specifying finite state machines or behavior trees or whatever. Um, and for simple branching logics, I wouldn't even use a task planner, okay? If the task complexity goes up and the multi-step reasoning happens, then I would bring in a task planner for that and still maybe just write it in a procedural case but not worry about all this extra stuff, okay? But when I start trying to get higher levels of reliability, that's when I think the extra burden of going to state, you know, to make the explicit contract between your planning, your behavior level computation, and the dynamical system time step becomes essential. And doing that right, I think, can, can take you to the next level. So I wish I had like, you know, here's the, in most of the, most of the topics we've talked about, I'd be like, you know, here's the function you call in Drake, <laughs> you know, here's the function. Um, most of these are not in, you know, in Drake right now. Um, they're not in many libraries. Um, one of the, I mean, some of the, even the planning stuff is, GPL'd in most places, um, so so finding a right, uh, you know, a good like PDBL uh, library to, to that if you could bring into Drake is actually non-trivial. Um, so, you know, this is a this is for me a, still a work in progress of trying to get that so you can actually like play with the full powerful systems. But I hope the concepts kind of land. Good. Okay. So um, please do reach out with us if you have questions and you're not sure what's going on with your project you know, reach out to us and uh, next week we'll start learning. <laughs>